I think to be a startup founder, you're just going to get, you get bashed in the head the first time you get up. <laughs> right? It's like boxing. Imagine you go in the ring and you get knocked out and you're like, well, fuck, excuse my language. But you can either walk out and be like, no, nah, it's not for me. Or you find a way to stay in that ring. Welcome to From the Ground Up, a podcast where we delve deep into the inspiring stories of entrepreneurs and their journey to build successful startups. I'm your host, Jake Aaron Villarreal, and in each episode, I sit down with the founders to learn about their experiences, the challenges they faced, the lessons they've learned, and the insights they've gained while turning their dreams into reality. And excited for us to have today Adam Stone, the CEO of Start Adam, the automation communication platform that helps remote and hybrid teams be more efficient in how they collaborate with the tools they prefer to use and how they get it done. Adam, welcome to the show. Thanks, Jake. Appreciate you having me. And we're going to dive more into your company and you're going to explain exactly your value proposition and the details of how your platform automates processes. But before we do that, we're going to dive a little bit more into you. I'll give just a little summary. So Adam, at the age of 14, you launched a company. You grew to 130,000 paying customers. At 18, you won the Australian Global Student Entrepreneur Award for Entrepreneurs Organization. You also uh, were the second youngest or I should say rather, so yeah, the second youngest founder to graduate from 500 Startups, the accelerator that we all know well and love. And at eight years into your experience, you now lead. So let's dive into your background a little bit here. Um, where did you grow up? Uh, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Also, I love the research that you do. That's, that's really awesome. Uh, yeah, so I grew up, I, I'm, I'm Australian. I grew up mostly in Melbourne, but I went to middle school in Chicago. So between the ages of nine and 14, uh, I was living in Chicago with my family and then at age 14 moved back to Australia. Uh, and that was actually a business, the first probably business challenge ever was I was selling BB guns on eBay when I was 11 or 12. Uh, and then when we moved back to Australia, their classes, uh, class A weapons in the same category as shotgun. So <laughs> I wanted to start another business that was not related to guns. <laughs> From my twenties, I sort of traveled around and now I'm based in Los Angeles. Got it. That's great. What was your first real job as a kid? I mean, selling BB guns at 11 years old, I assume was probably a great start as an entrepreneur, but did you have any jobs prior to that? When I was 15, my mom encouraged me to get a job at McDonald's so I could see how money is actually made. And I will forever have $10.26 in my mind as the amount that an hour of work is worth. So every time I spend $100, that's 10 hours of hard work and labor. So that was the only real job that I've had, thankfully. Wow, that's great. I know a lot of people have worked at McDonald's. It's a great company, but not many um, that, that I know have built startups and grown on to really have a lot of success in many different parts of their business. It's a great place to start. And it's really the foundation of how America has been built, you know, fast food and, and the food that you need to get quickly. And it's, it's great that, uh, you had that experience. It's actually um, a great job for someone, uh, in their teens. Um, even if you're honestly minded, it teaches you the value of, you know, hard work and everything, but. Also, I mean, there was a founder in Australia called Roslyn Kogan. He started uh, one of Australia's biggest e-commerce brands called Kogan.com. And he went through this stage, like the business grew because of press. Uh, and he, there was a big press article. He got rejected from applying to work at McDonald's. And he wanted to work there so he could learn the processes of the company. It's an amazingly process-oriented company where no matter where around the world you go, the Big Mac is the same thing, made by millions of different people. So as we, you know, try to create a consistent product experience it's an important learning absolutely yeah now what 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 inspired you to be an entrepreneur what was like in your dna did you have a model were your parents entrepreneurs how did that come about yeah so my mom was uh always a computer programmer when i was growing up she coded in COBOL and other languages. Um, my dad was uh an entrepreneur so my mom was sort of the breadwinner my dad was uh, running a running a business but um, I had this entrepreneurial journey and I'm, I, I always say I'm incredibly fortunate because I grew up sort of lower middle class. Then my dad read a book called The E-Myth Revisited, which he swears by. It's all about creating processes around your organization uh, and decided we needed to move to the US to scale his company. And so then I saw that whole experience and the stress and the, the phone calls every day. I was, it was, so it's in my DNA, but it's also 
my upbringing was seeing the true entrepreneurial journey. And then ultimately I saw the success. Um, so he was able to sell it to a public company. And so in my teens, I saw how the lifestyle change, changed. Excuse my dog squeezing on her toy. But yeah, I saw, I saw the lifestyle <laughs> sort of an improvement that we got from this stressful period and entrepreneurial journey. So I saw, I saw this, this, the full entrepreneurial arc, which I think even helps me today where it's like entrepreneurialism is hard, 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 but we're all in it because there's potentially something on the other side. And I think I know mm-hmm. that there's something on the other side because my dad went through that. My first business sort of went through that. And so, yeah, I'm just lucky to see the other side of the hard work, but also I know the hard work. Yeah. Got it. So we'll talk about your company start, Adam. What was your first startup that you launched? You had 130,000 paying customers. What was that? Walk us through that a little bit. Yeah. So, so my first business was, uh, selling mobile phone software. And we scaled that, as you said, to 130,000 or so paying customers globally. But what was really interesting was uh, how process-oriented we actually were and how automated we were at fulfillment um, and yeah, delivery. We had 400 support tickets a day at some points, um, but I was working 10 minutes a week on the business. Um, wow. Because I was in high school and university. So I had no choice but to figure out ways of scaling the business. Ed- education was important for me. I mean, I, I, I wasn't really interested in dropping out or anything. Business has always been to support my lifestyle. And I like to remind myself of that. So my lifestyle at the time was simple. I was a student. I had friends. I wanted to socialize. Um, uh, and I think, yeah, that, that was a very important thing for me. So constructing processes and scaling a team that had to be self-sufficient uh, was important. So I learned out of that, that my time needs to be leveraged. My time isn't what runs the company. My time is what grows the company or keeps it going. Uh, I think there's a, there's a difference there. Absolutely. Yeah. It's operating in the business and then growing the business and how you improve the business is, I think, very important for the leader of the company. Um, how big did you grow that company as a team? Or was it just you? No, no. So we had a team of, uh, I think at our biggest, probably 20 something people. Um, yeah. So 20 so, people in high school that you were running the company oh. and then you graduate high school and you're in the U.S., mm-hmm. correct? Or are you still in, are you in Australia at this point? Uh, went to the U.S. when I was like 20, some 20. Yeah. Okay. Got it. So what was the next company after that? Built? So, yeah. So I, I actually moved to the U.S. to start the next company, which was Speed Lancer. And so Speed Lancer was the first verticalized freelancing marketplace platform. Now I have a list of 700 and that was part of the pivot uh, to start Adam um, was just this influx of services businesses in a post COVID landscape where everyone realized that, oh, companies and people work from home. Why aren't there platforms that match these people together? But Speed Lancer was the first one and we were very early to the market. Every investor thought we were totally crazy. Um, But I was a big user of Upwork, which was Odesk and Elance and they merged into Upwork. I was, I remember, probably one of the first users of Fiverr. Um, and so- I love Fiverr. Yeah, I mean, it was just a miracle. Um, and so that was part of the way that I scaled that business down to a 10 minute, the previous business down to a 10 minute work week was by leveraging these platforms so that I could hire people who were not um, sitting next to me. And so I knew there was a demand, but I also knew there was a bunch of issues with it. So the hiring, picking, choosing, recruiting process, handing off work from one person to the next because you can't really find a, a broad, generalist who is very good at everything someone's good at content writing they're good at content writing but they're not necessarily a good researcher so i would need to have a researcher and then a writer then you need to find another designer and i realized that agencies which were actually i was told by the previous ceo of upwork half of their workers were actually agencies delivering work and that's because you have multiple people who all need to contribute to delivering a campaign so there was all this margin fluff so upwork fees you have agency fees and then um, you have sort of the inefficiencies of, of dealing with that. And so Speed Lancer was born as a very high margin services business, um, which used technology to assemble teams of talent together on the fly. And so we were the first, uh, probably still the only workflow driven freelancing platform um, where if you want to hire a content marketing team, we do exactly that or a podcast production team. Uh, we can reach out to people for you, edit the video, 
create social media clips around it, create the graphic, do a talking heads animation. So we had 200 of these bundles or workflows, um, which actually dispatched work out to individuals, connected them together, handed off work from one to the next, briefed them on what they needed to do. I mean, we were producing full animation videos without actually a human producer at all. Um, and what was cool was we were the first uh, Slack integration that did anything. So we matched uh, clients with freelancers and then brought the freelancer in and out of the same channel according to their step of the workflow. Uh, and it would follow up with the freelancer until the task was done. If they were running late, it would let the client know. If there was a deliverable, the freelancer would deliver the task. It would go to the client. The client would give a thumbs up or ask for a revision, all in Slack. And it was anonymized um, because it was our Slack bot in the middle. And so anyway, at the end of COVID, um, I wanted to build more integrations. So not just Slack, I wanted to build on Microsoft Teams as well. So speaking with our uh, development advisor, uh, and we sort of discussed that, yeah, we can build all those integrations, but it would require a full rebuild of the infrastructure. And then we were discussing, we're going to do a full rebuild of the infrastructure. Let's do it properly as a standalone SaaS that actually helps other companies and marketplaces. And that's where Star Atom was born. So we're an automation suite uh, designed for any human to human business interaction, which it turns out most. <laughs> business interactions are human to human. At some point, there's humans involved, right? So it doesn't yeah. sense to me that we need to log on to all these different platforms uh, to get work done. Uh, everything should be sort of chat-oriented chat first, um, and that hasn't really been done properly yet. So that's what we're heads down working on. That's great. Now, are you an engineer by trade, or how did you build an engineering team it sounds like you're the product visionary. You've got the idea, the concept. How did you pull engineering together to build a platform like this? I mean, from a young age, I, I hired my first engineer when I was 14 or 15 uh, off Upwork. So I've been, I've been working with engineers from a young age, nonstop. So I, I'm definitely not technical. I, I equate it to um, being a, a blind person. And I don't mean anything against blind people. It's just an analogy, right? Like... I'm navigating around streets um, without using my eyes. Like, I don't know how to code, and it is challenging, and it's a bit ridiculous at times. And I know people say, oh, you know, you can't be a tech founder of a tech company without knowing how to code. Well, you have different perspectives, different visions that you can add, right? Like, I'm thinking so in-depth about the product experience itself uh, and how different APIs might fit together. So I'm technical, I just can't code. Um, and I leave the coding to the to our professionals. We've got an amazing engineering team. My CTO is a uh, and co-founder is an AI professor from uh, from Brazil um, with a background in social robotics, social robots, and AI. Um, so yeah, I don't know. It, like it forces me to get a really good team around me to make up for my. Uh, yeah, no, that's great. I know that. Everybody can't be an engineer, and but it's really the product and understanding is there a gap in the market you can bring a product into that can fill a need. And it sounds like you're doing that with Start Adam. Um, you talked a little bit about the idea and how, how it came into a transition to bringing this from your previous company to market. Um, at what point in that company did you have the aha moment of, you know, there's probably more demand here that we can create or maybe building a SaaS company will open this up a lot more to other companies. Like, how did that come together? Was the, the other company doing great or was it, did you see, I mean, there was a lot of competition in, in the marketplace at that point. Was it just a question of, we have something, we know where we can navigate towards, but we got to look at, you know, another market or a rebuild. Like, walk me through that just a little bit more. Definitely a lot of competition, especially since COVID. The company was doing okay. As I said, investors never believed in us. So we sort of raised a small amount of money a few times and had mm -hmm. a couple of large rounds fall through at the last minute for a couple of reasons. Had a co-founder pull out 24 hours before funds were due to be wired in 2019. He just wasn't feeling it anymore. Um, before that, we had a, a diligence fall through because part of the diligence was a uh, fund who decided to get a logo designed with us and they didn't like the logo. It's like, well, your current logo is fine. You're not actually testing it as a real customer. Um, yeah, there were three rounds that fell through. Another one went through six weeks of daily due diligence and then pulled out because the other partner couldn't get conviction around freelancing marketplaces. These rounds ranged, ranged from small 
to large uh and they got very close you know and so dealt with a, you talked about setbacks in the beginning i'm like yeah we got a lot of setbacks like a f ton of i don't know if i can swear on this one but a lot of setbacks uh over an eight year period i mean i had a visa rejected i wasn't allowed in the u.s for two and a half so just like setback after setback after setback we, was, we were doing, it was like we were designed to fail kind of but um despite that we had pages and pages and pages of five star reviews from our customers and that's what kept us going and the impact we were making to freelancers and giving them gap fit gap filler work was important so we did about ten thousand projects so not like a million projects like some of our competitors or a couple of the competitors have done um but we certainly didn't do enough where we could break out you know and become a become a success or a household name that that people actually know so to answer your question of when it became a SaaS that was most interesting it sort of just happened um it was like maybe the last hurrah in a way uh mm -hmm. of transitioning this thing and trying to use our technology for an, for another more valuable um way and i think we're really onto something potentially if we can position it right in the market that's great yeah i mean there's so many lessons that are learned we've talked to so many founders that you know the the trials and tribulations are just incredible uh, if you could put a film on it yeah, i think it would open up the eyes to a lot of potential entrepreneurs that are thinking about going into it you just you never know the true story of you know when it's good, it's great, but when it's not good, like what you have to go through. And it, it takes a certain person that can stomach a certain amount and, you know, perseverance. So that's great to, um, to hear those. I think a lot of the, the learning and the lessons come out of those experiences so that you can continue to grow and build and, and inspire others too. So uh, I don't, I have not talked to a founder yet that hasn't had a tremendous downside before they had upside. And, um, I've interviewed over 20,000 people uh, and not all entrepreneurs and founders, but, you know, there's always opportunities to grow and build and, and create, but it has to come from that chip on your shoulder, the ability to believe that you have an idea that you can bring to another level and, and hopefully you have the right team to do that with you. But as the leader, you're the one that has to inspire and provide the vision and, and, and be the positive voice. And so, you know, I think it's important to, um, to have the makeup and the DNA. And if you started early, it just gives you, I think, more of an advantage uh, uh, to, to continue to, to build, you know, this startup and other startups. You never know where things go. Um, give me a specific use case. So for the listeners that want to start Adam, Walk me through a specific use case of how it would work. Yeah, so we're building, um, I guess, very use case or value oriented product in in on route to our vision of being this, you know, chat OS. So the use cases right now, uh, last week we actually acquired the domain a dot link. Um, so you could have, uh, I don't want to miss say your last name, Villarreal. Okay, perfect. Uh, so you could have a dot link slash Jake Villarreal right um and whenever anyone clicks on that link it will actually connect you from your conversation tool to theirs so let's say you're on slack all day or discord all day and the other person's on microsoft teams or telegram or discord whatsapp sms doesn't matter what platform they're on they can connect with you from that tool to yours the next thing that does is it enables you to add those leads into a crm it's like hubspot or salesforce which is going to come out in the next um you know, hopefully a month, uh, a copy of the conversation um, actually going to your CRMs is super useful for sales teams or super useful for just like us to stay connected. Like, why should we have to email? Uh, why can't we just do it via chat? So we give everyone their A dot link. And what that is, that, that, that ingests new users for us. It's very useful for services teams, startups, do it. You've got a bunch of contractors, useful contractors with a bunch of clients. Uh, and so on. And then what we're building is the ability to superpower the conversation. So payments, translation, uh, ability to set reminders and tasks for you or the other person. Um, we already have a Jira and a Trello integration where you can actually assign a task to multiple people from those tools and it follows up with that person until the task is done and then asks you to review the work once it's delivered and updates uh, you or the client um, when the task is done. So we're, we're building a full project management automation and communication hub uh, where it's communication centric uh, and tool agnostic. 
Wow, that's great. Click this link and you can claim your ADOT link so you authorize your tool and then it'll put you through a chat flow where you can claim your ADOT link, create a new group between many other people. Another feature we're releasing really soon is called um, broadcast groups. So you can create a group, you get the group link for that group and then you can change it to a broadcast only channel so you can send messages. So if you wanted to create one for your podcast, uh, you could have like ADOT match relevant, for example, uh, and uh, anyone can join and it's like a newsletter, but it's chat based. So you can, wow. uh, you can, you can send out so you can subscribe from any communication tool you like. So do you need to have a subscription to whatever tool you're using, which you typically would have anyway. And then from there, you just can link to whatever other tool, whoever's on your team or collaborate with whoever you want to collaborate with, uh, without any further integration work you need to do personally, your system or your application kind of sits in the middle of multiple different collaboration tools and, and essentially you're just off and running. Yes, exactly. That's great. Um, where do you see the big opportunity in, in the business currently? A few things. We've got some benefits in terms of virality. Um, so one user, if we're talking, I innately invite you to the conversation. Uh, if there's three of us having a discussion, I need to invite two other people to the conversation. Uh, you can then, you will then be given your ADOT link. So we're hoping that say 10% of people go and invite someone else to a conversation. Say it's your accountant. Why do I have to email my accountant? Yeah. I should be chatting with them, so, right? So I can just send my ADOT link. Anyone here can join ADOT link slash Adam Stone. You're talking directly with me. Um, why doesn't my accountant, my lawyer talk to me that way? So hopefully we get some virality um, and additional users. So we've started to see that uh, already. Um, and then I guess going up market and really trying to charge companies for being involved in a chat operating system or chatify in their business uh, we've got some advantages innately there where we can build your platform on multiple different tools very rapidly got it so the pay model is really enterprise to the big companies and then as a individual user if i have an a dot link or the link that you can join that's is that free or how does that work so you can join as many channels as you want. Otherwise, we'll give you two channels that you can create for free or two groups for free. Uh, and beyond that, you pay $13.99 per month um, and you get unlimited groups that you can create. That's great. That's and really then if you're, cool. if you're creating broadcast groups, that's part of that premium feature set, which would be about $25 a month. But it means you could have a newsletter running to people's communication tools for only $25 a month. That's great. Yeah, we definitely have to talk. Um, you said that your lead engineer is uh, got a lot of background in AI. With the recent breakthroughs in AI, do you see that playing a uh, a role in your in your platform? Yes, absolutely. I think that um, AI as a collaborative assistant is very interesting for us. Um, I think that collaborating, let's say, I'm collaborating with a marketing contractor or a marketing agency. And we're trying to come up with ideas. We're talking together to ideate, not all the time, but you know, a lot of the time. Having ChatGPT in there with you in the conversation is um, very interesting for us. Um, yeah, I think that's that's one way. Another way is, let's say, uh, you'll you'll like this. I'm going to make it a bit more engineer oriented. Um, we integrate with Jira, and you can get weekly updates on your team's Jira progress sent to you as an AI summary in a specific channel each week. And that can be done for clients also. So if you're a development agency, anyone in the channel can request a weekly update be sent in the channel. And then we want to expand that to multiple areas of the organization. Wow, that's great. Yeah, it's integrated into a lot of different sectors. So I think software and, and SaaS is really, I mean, it's a natural fit if you can find the opportunity there, but that's really cool. Um, Talk to me a little bit about younger in your career. We just, I want to loop back a little bit here on 500 startups. How did that come about and what were you pitching there? Uh, so I, my dad ran an accelerator program in, in Melbourne, Australia. So it was the first um, accelerator in Melbourne um, called Angel Cube back in the day. Um, and I was sort of, we could call it interning at, the start, at, a, at one of their events. And so they had a startup batch uh, in the program. Um, and uh, yeah, they, they had a startup batch and Dave McClure from 500 Startups came in uh, and 
gave everyone the chance to pitch him on their company and everyone had prepared pre-prepared these 90 second pitches uh, and i was sitting in the corner of the room and i was like hey does anyone mind if i do a pitch on something i'm thinking about and it was speed lancer before we had built anything at all um and um so everyone was like yeah sure and but everyone else had prepared their pitch and i had it so i came in with a totally unprepared 90 second pitch uh and Dave was quiet and didn't give me any feedback. And I was like, it's a little bit arrogant. Like, why didn't he give me any <laughs> feedback? He gave everyone else feedback. He just looked at me and he goes, hmm. Then next, I was like, thanks. <laughs> why didn't I get any feedback? And then the next day he came up to me and he goes, um, how do I invest? And I was like, wow. Because I'd seen other, like I, I was involved in this, Not in, my dad had run the accelerator for a good couple of years before that. And I'd seen some of his companies go to 500. And I was like, wow, that's so cool. And I mean, it just wasn't on my radar. You know, when something's like so cool to you, you don't even, it's not even on your agenda. It's like not even on your cards. Like I was 19 right. years old. I was like, maybe one day I'll build something worthy of that, you know? Uh, and it got offered to me and it was, I originally said no. I rejected Dave because he um, said I needed to go there in two weeks and I was in law school actually in Australia. And I said, uh, can I join next year? Like I can't do it right now i'm in the middle of a semester uh and he goes no now or never i was like all right and i'm very grateful i'm actually speaking to dave later today funnily enough um but very grateful I, I wouldn't be here now if he didn't do that to me or take that chance on me like in all ways i, I wouldn't i probably wouldn't be living in la like it's just uh one of those things that who is it that's uh, uh, um who's the guy who just i'm not your guru forget his name the the tony robbins yeah, Tony Robbins. Thank you. I just went blank. But he says in in that in in that um, movie, is your life if you look back on it changes from one or two pivotal events where you can see the path sort of fork in the road, and you need to be open when these events come to you. You need to be open to pick the pick the right path. And I think yeah, it's just very very profound. Yeah, one- that's great. I'm- yeah. That's sorry to cut you off there. I'm a huge Tony Robbins fan, and I believe a lot of um, his strategies and thoughts and how he approaches not just business but also life is incredible. I mean, he's got now 106 companies, does seven billion a year in revenue. Um, but it's yeah, psychology is 80 percent of business, 20 percent innovation. So I think it's I think that's what it is. I think it's 80 20 yeah, marketing, innovation and marketing. So. Um, that's great that you pulled that out of there. Um, 500 Startups is an is a accelerator that we love. Did you go all the way through the process and from there launch the company um, or a company? That, your last that company? Was, that was Speedland. So we came in with nothing and we ended up with a product. Um, that was a stressful period also. Like I had outsourced the entire team. So I'm just sitting there. Everyone else has a 20 person team or 10 person team. And uh, 500 actually grilled me like two months into the program. They pulled me into a border with like 10 people and they were like what are you doing all day uh and i was like well i've, I've got a team like i've got like five or six people engineers customer support like everything we're doing some transactions that and they're like all right <laughs> but they didn't believe me because i was just me sort of sitting at my laptop and working hard and they're like what are you doing like we had no product like it was stressful but anyway we got through it <laughs> what's your experience been like post covid um yeah. with this remote works in in hybrid and the trend of potentially coming back like how is your company operating today are you 100 percent remote are you hybrid you're out of l what's um what's the makeup look like there yeah we're fully remote or just yeah distributed uh we have a team in brazil and then we have a couple of contractors in the philippines and turkey um yeah so fully remote i would say yeah got it great so your product and your platform start adam is it for companies that are also on site or is it only really perfect for remote collaboration? No, so the, our whole thing is we want, we understand that a company is not just all in one spot, not all centralized. There's going to be people involved, agencies, contractors, other firms, freelancers, part timers, whatever, who are not, who don't sit in, in your Microsoft Teams account, right? So we, as we build our project management, our AI project manager uh, suite, we want it to be tool agnostic. So we are made just as much for internal teams as external collaborators, as we call them. Got it. 
Great. Well, I know that um, being an entrepreneur has a lot of successes and failures. You talked a little bit about some of the pains you had just trying to come to America and a lot of starts and stops. What's the one, let's not call it a failure, a lesson learned that you've gained over the last eight years that you could share with the audience, the listeners that are startup founders today might be founders in the future. Yeah. I mean, you talked a lot about psychology. It's something I'm really fascinated by, um, out of necessity, right? Um, I think one of the things you have to learn to be a long-term startup founder, like think of Jack Dorsey, think of Elon Musk or whatever, they've all been at it for just so long. Um, Jack Dorsey starts his day every day with meditation. So he says, regardless of what happens later that day, or it, maybe it's yoga, I think it's meditation, but he says he does something for himself, aka yoga, such that the rest of the day, no matter what happens, it's already been a good day, right? So he's made it a good day, regardless of what happens in his company. And I think to be a startup founder, you're just going to get, you get bashed in the head the first time you get up, right? <laughs> it's like, imagine you go in the ring and you get knocked out and you're like, well, fuck, excuse my language, but you can either walk out and be like, no, nah, it's not for me. Or you find a way to stay in that ring until eventually you win. But if you don't win, at least you've had a good fight, right? You enjoyed the actual art of boxing, which I'm also a fan of. But I think, um, yes, yeah, psychology is just really important. And I've learned, you asked about learnings. Like for me, I've, I've learned how to develop the emotional resistance, resilience, sorry, over the last uh, eight years, especially. But I'm also very fortunate because I had an early win. And I think that helps me. And I saw my dad's win. So it's nice when you see success that not everyone sees so to not know that success can be possible that's why i think role models are so important you need to know that success is possible even when you don't see it for yourself uh, and then you see it trust your ability to keep getting up you stand up get knocked down you stand back up you get knocked down you stand back up and uh you have to sort of develop a passion for that whole rhythm yeah that's great there's a lot of uh employees today that work for leaders that aren't inspired they might not feel like they're taking the company in the direction they think or believe it can it should go um what's the mission of start adam and what do you convey to not just the the, the world but to your employees about what you're building and the purpose behind it uh it's a very similar vision to speed lancer actually uh, our mission for Speed Lancer was always that technology can assist um, people to people interactions. So I don't like building technology personally that replaces people. Um, I respect people that do, but it's just not something I'm personally passionate about. I like to see the people on the other end that it impacts and helps. And um, that's just part of the passion. So with Speed Lancer, you know, using technology to give freelancers gap filler work in their day and to smooth out their cash flow and give them projects when they're sitting on their couch with nothing else to do. That was really cool. And then impacting clients uh, where they could realize the talent they could have instantly available. Uh, and just seeing that on both sides of school. So with Star Adam, it's the same sort of vision. It's using technology to connect people and connect applications together in a new, much more intuitive um, way. And so I think, that's, I think that's our vision is increasing productivity using technology to impact our interactions on a daily basis. That's great. How do you stay positive? The sun rises every day, doesn't it? So I don't know, shit happens in life, but we got to look for the positives. That's great. Yep. I love it. Great. Well, cool. Well, I love what you're building. I actually am going to introduce you to a, some, some CEOs that I think could take advantage of your product. Um, you've had an amazing career journey at a young age. Um, and I'm sure that a lot of listeners here that are also young will be inspired by your story. Um, love to check back in with you in, in, a, in a while down the road to see the growth and the progress. Uh, again, just for the listeners, where can they go to find Start Adam? Um, thank you. You're very sweet. The, uh, yeah, the best way would be startout.com. Um, you can type in your email and click let's go. Uh, you could also go to a.link and sign up that way. Perfect. Well, there you have it. You've heard it right from the man's voice. Thanks, Adam, for joining today. Appreciate your time and look forward to the future. And we'll see you on the next episode. Before we wrap up, I want to give a big shout out to all the entrepreneurs that have joined to make this podcast possible. 
and for all the listeners for listening. It means the world to me that you chose to spend your time with us today. I'm your host, Jake Aaron Villarreal, signing off for now, but can't wait to connect with you all soon on the next episode. Take care. This show is sponsored by Match Relevant, a company that helps venture back startups find the best people in the market, and they do it in three simple steps. First, they sit down with founders to understand their story. Second, they tell their story into multiple candidate channels. And third, they schedule interviews within 48 hours. Find us at matchrelevant.com to learn more about how we do it.